Dr. Sage here. In today's video, we're going to discuss the tools and techniques of genetic engineering. By the end of this video, you should be able to provide examples of practical applications of modern genetic technologies, explain the role of restriction endonucleases in the process of genetic engineering, describe how gel electrophoresis is used to analyze DNA, list the steps in the polymerase chain reaction, and discuss one disadvantage to this technique, and describe how recombinant DNA is created, discuss its role in gene cloning. Genetic engineering is an applied science. It involves applications from basic research science. For example, utilizing DNA to identify a suspect in a crime, fixing the underlying genetic mutations to treat disease, or using RNA regulatory molecules to permanently fix diseases. Some intrinsic properties of DNA include helicase is able to unwind the strands of the double helix just as easily in the lab as it does inside a cell. DNA strands separate when exposed to temperatures just below boiling. And complementary nucleotides will hydrogen bond and the strands will regain their double-stranded form. Restriction endonucleases are enzymes which clip DNA crosswise at selected positions. They recognize foreign DNA. They're capable of breaking the phosphodiester bonds between adjacent nucleotides on both strands of DNA. They protect bacteria and archaea from bacteriophage or plasmids. And each endonuclease recognizes a sequence of four to 10 base pairs. So the endonucleases recognize and clip at palindromes, which are sequences of DNA that are identical when read from the five prime to three prime direction on one strand and the five prime to three prime direction on the other strand. The endonucleases often leave sticky ends, which are staggered symmetrical cuts that leave short tails, four to five bases along in each strand. These are base pair with complementary tails and other DNA fragments or plasmids. Okay, here's an example of how a restriction endonuclease would work. First, they work at palindrome. So if you're going from five prime here, for example, to three prime, and you read it, it reads G, G, A, T, C, C. The other strand from five prime to three prime also reads G, G, A, T, C, C. So that's a palindrome. Now, a particular restriction on nuclease would recognize this palindrome and cut between the two G bases on both strands. That would then leave sticky ends, so a single-stranded overhang on each of the double strands that were left over. These are called sticky ends because they want to re bond to complementary base pair with their complementary sequence. Some endonucleases do not leave sticky ends. They result in blunt end cutting. So for example, this endonuclease recognizes the GGCC, GGCC, and cuts between the G and the C on both strands, leaving blunt ends, not sticky ends. Restriction fragments are pieces of DNA produced by restriction endonucleases. Restriction fragment length polymorphisms are differences in the cutting pattern of specific restriction endonucleases that give rise to restriction patterns of different lengths. This allows direct comparison of DNA of two different organisms at a specific site. So here, for example, if we have a normal strand of DNA versus one that's been mutated, the mutation alters the base pairs and results in one of the restriction sites being missing. So when the restriction enzyme cuts this DNA and then you run it out on a gel, we'll talk about gels in a couple of minutes, it result in different patterns in one versus the other. Ligase is necessary to seal sticky ends together by rejoining the phosphate sugar bonds cut by endonucleases. The main application is final splicing of genes into plasmids and chromosomes. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that replicates HIV and other retroviruses. What reverse transcriptase does is it converts RNA into DNA. That can then make complementary DNA or cDNA. It's made from messenger, transfer, ribosomal, and other forms of RNA. It's useful in synthesizing eukaryotic genes from mRNA transcripts because the gene is free of introns. CRISPR, or clustered regulatory interspace short palindromic repeats. In bacteria and archaea, these are short lengths of DNA with repeating nucleotides. Enzymes in CRISPR system recognize and cut out foreign DNA left behind by invading bacteriophages or plasmids. Scientists exploit the system to cut DNA in just about any organism exactly where they want to cut the DNA. Gel electrophoresis produces a readable pattern of DNA fragments. Samples of DNA are joined in compartments in a soft agar gel and subjected to an electrical current. The negative charge on the phosphate groups cause the DNA to move towards the positive pole on the gel. The rate of movement of DNA through the gel is based on the size of fragments. Positions of DNA fragments are determined by staining the DNA fragments in the gel. The electrophoresis patterns are distinctive. They're useful in characterizing DNA fragments. 
and allow for a comparison of genetic similarities among samples as in a genetic fingerprint. So here's a brief summary of how gel electrophoresis works. An agar and buffer solution is poured into a plastic tray and a comb, this blue thing here, is placed into one end of the tray. The agar polymerizes and turns into a gel as it cools. The comb is then removed from the gel to form wells in the gel. DNA samples color the tracking dye are pipetted into the wells. The tray is then placed into a chamber that generates electric current through the gel. The negative electrode is placed on the side nearest the samples, and the positive electrode is placed on the other side. DNA, which has a negative charge, will be drawn to the positive electrode. Smaller DNA molecules will be able to travel faster through the gel. One well, called a DNA ladder, will contain DNA fragments of known sizes. The ladder is used to determine the sizes of the other samples. Two different nucleic acids can hybridize by uniting at their complementary regions. SSDNA can hybridize with SSDNA or RNA. RNA can hybridize with other RNA. And this can be used for gene probes, which are short stretches of DNA of a known sequence that will base pair with a stretch of DNA with a complementary sequence, if one exists in the sample. The probes will carry reporter molecules such as fluorescent dyes so that areas of hybridization can be visualized. Enzyme-linked probes are detected when non-pigmented substrates become colored molecules by the action of the enzyme. So let's say we have a sample of DNA that we isolate. We then denature that DNA, which you can do by heating it up to make it single-stranded DNA. And you combine it with DNA probes. So a DNA probe would be a DNA sequence that you're looking for that's been tagged with some probe. It could be a fluorescent dye that glows a certain color. Then when you combine the single strand DNA with the DNA probes, the complementary base pairs will pair up. And now your DNA strand that you started with will now be tagged with whatever that tag is, like the fluorescent dot. So what do we use gene probes for? Well, they can be used to diagnose the cause of an infection from a patient's specimen, and identifying a culture of an unknown bacteria or virus. Here's an example of the nucleic acid hybridization test. It does not require electrophoresis. DNA is isolated, denatured, and placed on an absorbent filter, and combined with microbe-specific probe. The blot is then developed and observed for areas of hybridization. So let's say we have colonies growing on a petri dish. We then place a membrane on top of those colonies. So we blot the cells onto that membrane. The cells are then lysed or broken open and DNA is denatured and fixed onto the membrane. You then attach the label probes for the particular DNA sequence you're looking for. And then you visualize it to see where those DNA probes are and that tells you which colonies have that DNA that you're looking for. Probes are also used for fluorescent and C2 hybridization, or FISH. Probes are applied to intact cells. They're observed microscopically for the presence and location of specific genetic marker sequences on genes. This is a very effective way to identify genes on chromosomes. It's also effective in identifying bacteria living in natural habitats without culturing them. And it's used to detect RNA in cells and tissues. Here's an example of FISH. So this is an image that I took from Drosophila melanogaster or fruit flies. They have four different types of chromosomes. So you can see in this figure that two X chromosomes, two chromosome twos, two chromosome threes, and two chromosome fours. The blue stains DNA in general, and then specific DNA probes will find particular sequences within those chromosomes. For example, this probe AAGAG you can find in this region on chromosome three. Whereas this probe, AACAC, you can find in some parts of chromosome 2. The relative sizes of nucleic acids are denoted by the number of base pairs or nucleotides they contain. Palindromic sequences recognized by endonucleases are between 4 and 10 base pairs. The average gene in E. coli is 1,300 base pairs or 1.3 kilobases. The entire genome of E. coli is 4.7 million base pairs or 4,700 kilobases or 4.7 megabases. The human mitochondria has a genome of 16 kilobases, the Epstein-Barr virus, 172 kilobases, and the human genome is 1.3 billion base pairs on 46 separate chromosomes. Another technique very often used is polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR rapidly increases the amount of DNA in a sample without need for making cultures or carrying out complex purification techniques. It can replicate a target DNA from just a few copies to billions of copies within a few hours. It's very sensitive, so it can detect cancer from a single cell, and it can diagnose an infection from a single gene copy. PCR uses the same events as DNA replication. So opening up of the double helix, 
using the exposed strands as templates, addition of primers, and then action of a DNA polymerase. Some of the ingredients we use to perform PCR includes primers, which are synthetic oligonucleotides of a known sequence of 15 to 30 bases that indicate where the DNA application should begin. Then we have DNA polymerases, which are enzymes responsible for the replication of DNA. Each version completes a unique portion of the replication process. The high temperatures used in PCR necessitate use of DNA polymerases isolated from thermophilic bacteria. So the PCR technique uses a thermocycler that automatically performs the cyclic temperature changes. The three basic steps are denaturation, priming, and extension. Cyclic repetition of these steps amplifies the DNA. So we start with a DNA sample, which is double-stranded DNA. We heat it up to almost boiling, which is denatures the DNA, makes it single-stranded DNA. We then apply primer, the primer will anneal or complementary base pair to the DNA. Then we add DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase builds new DNA using the information from the template DNA. So what we started out as a, a single copy of double stranded DNA at the end of one cycle of PCR, we have two copies. Then we take these two copies and repeat the process. Denature it, apply primer, allow extension of DNA polymerase. We go from two copies to four copies. Repeat it again, go from four to eight. Repeat it again, go from eight to 16, etc. Every time you perform one cycle, you double the amount of DNA. Additional PCR techniques involve real-time PCR, which can detect products during the reaction instead of at the end. And PCR can be adapted to analyze RNA. RNA is first converted to DNA with reverse transcriptase. PCR is essential for things such as gene mapping, the study of genetic defects in cancer, forensics, infectious disease diagnosis, and taxonomic studies. Recombinant DNA technology is deliberately removing genetic material from one organism and combining it with that of a different organism. This involves a formation of genetic clones. Cloning is the removal of a selected gene from an animal, plant, or microorganism, that's the genetic donor. The gene is inserted into a vector, which can be a plasmid or a virus, that will then be inserted into a cloning host, usually a bacteria or a yeast cell. The gene is translated into protein product for which that gene codes. All right, so here's an example. Let's say that we need to make insulin, which is a protein, okay? Because some humans need insulin injections. Well, we don't take insulin from one human to give to another human. Instead, what we've done is we've taken the DNA that codes for insulin, so the insulin gene, out of the human nucleus. We then take a plasmid. We cut the plasmid with the same restriction endonucleases that we cut this gene out with. So they're both left with sticky ends, which will then combine and insert the insulin gene into the now recombinant plasmid DNA. This plasmid is then taken up into a bacteria cell. As the bacteria replicate, they also make copies of this plasmid. And then this plasmid, which is in the bacteria, is then used to produce protein, in this case, the insulin protein. So what we're doing is we're using bacteria's little factories for us to grow human insulin protein. So how do we obtain genes in an isolated state? Well, DNA is removed from cells and separated into fragments by endonucleases. Genes can be synthesized from isolated mRNA transcripts using reverse transcriptase. So going from mRNA to DNA is called cDNA, complementary DNA. And a gene can be amplified using PCR. This can be used to make genomic libraries. This is where genes maintained in a cloning host and vector, just like microbial pure culture. Collections of DNA clones represent the entire genome of numerous organisms. So for example, let's say we wanted to have a library of every gene that is in this nematode, C. elegans. What we do is we extract the DNA from that organism. We then take plasmids. We cut them with both the same restriction endonucleases. That then inserts the genes from this organism into the plasmid. You then take these plasmids and put them into bacteria cells and grow them as individual colonies. Each colony will then have one gene, which came from this worm, C. elegans, growing in these bacteria. If you do this enough, you can have the entire genome, all of the genes from this organism, now growing in bacteria colonies. Instead of creating a genomic library, you can also create a cDNA library. So remember, what cDNA is, is you take mRNA, you add reverse transcriptase to build cDNA. Now, why might you do that? Why use cDNA instead of ge genomic DNA? Well, a couple of reasons. For one reason, cDNA, since you're taking it from mRNA, 
it's already had its introns removed. So bacteria being prokaryotes, they don't know how to remove introns. So if you insert a genomic DNA sequence into the bacteria, they probably can't build the correct human protein because they don't know how to remove the introns from the mRNA. But if you start with cDNA, it already has its introns removed. Then whenever you insert it into bacteria, the prokaryote, it can build the correct protein, even though it doesn't have the ability to remove introns, which isn't a problem because the introns have already been removed. The other reason you use the cDNA library is if you're only interested in the genes that are being specifically expressed. Not every gene that organism has, but every gene that's currently being used. And you can use this to compare things. For example, take a C. elegans that's a very young worm and a C. elegans that's a very old worm and compare the cDNA from them. Well, then you're comparing which genes are being used in the young versus the old worms. So cloning vectors can be plasmids, which are small, well-characterized, easy to manipulate. They can be transferred into appropriate host cells through transformation. And there can be plasmids that carry genetic markers for resistance to antibiotics. Or you could actually use bacteriophage, which have the natural ability to inject DNA into a bacterial host through transduction. So important aspects of cloning vectors, they need to have an origin of replication so that the vector, the plasmid, will be replicated with DNA polymerase of the cloning host, just like it will replicate its own chromosome. It must accept DNA of a certain size, and it typically contains a gene that confers drug resistance to the cloning host. That way, the bacteria that is resistant to a certain antibiotic, you know has that vector that you've inserted into those bacteria. Desirable features of microbial cloning host is rapid turnover and fast growth rate. Can be grown in large quantities using ordinary culture methods. Non-pathogenic. A genome that is well mapped. Capable of accepting plasmids or bacteriophage vectors. Maintains foreign genes throughout multiple generations and will secrete a high yield of proteins from expressed foreign genes. The ingredients for gene cloning involve the gene you're interested in, for example, the insulin gene or the interferon gene, and a cloning vector, which is usually a plasmid. The steps in gene cloning involve both the foreign DNA, so let's say human DNA, and a plasmid, that that plasmid has ampicillin resistance, are cut with the same restriction enzyme. In the plasmid, the restriction site occurs in the middle of the single copy of the LAX-Z gene. So it has the LAX-Z gene here. It will cut in the middle of this LAX-Z gene. When functional, the LAX-Z gene will lead to the production of an enzyme, beta-galactosidase. Cutting the LAX-Z gene prevents the eventual production of the enzyme, beta-galactosidase. The restriction enzyme leaves complementary sticky ends on the foreign DNA fragment and the plasmid. This allows the foreign DNA to be inserted into the plasmid when the sticky ends anneal. Adding DNA ligase reattaches the DNA backbones, so you then create these recombinant DNA plasmids. The plasmids are combined with a culture of actively growing bacteria. Some cells do not take up plasmids, others take up non-recombinant plasmids, and a few take up the recombinant plasmids. So some you won't take up the plasmid at all, some you take up the plasmid that did not have a foreign gene inserted into it. And then some it takes up the plasmid that has that foreign gene that you're looking for. Then bacteria are cultured on a plate with ampicillin and a substance that changes color when exposed to the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So since it contains ampicillin, bacteria that don't have the plasmid won't grow on it. The bacteria that have plasmids will grow on it. If they have a non-recombinant plasmid, then the LAC-Z gene is intact and it will form blue colonies. And again, those are not the ones you want. If it has a plasmid where a gene was inserted into the plasmid, then it will be able to grow because it has ampicillin resistance and it will not make blue colonies because you disrupted the LAC-Z gene. Those would then be the colonies you're looking for. So this is a brief introduction to the tools and techniques of genetic engineering. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.